Good morning, everyone. I'm Kimberly Achalia with PHCA. Thanks so much for joining us for today's webinar presented by Julie Pellini. A few quick updates to share before we get started today. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the PHCA website. The webinar has been approved for one continuing education credit for all attendees. For those who provided a NAB number, credits will be uploaded within the next two to three weeks. We'll also share certificates with those in attendance. As we begin today, all attendees will be in listen-only mode. Please feel free to submit any questions that you have via the chat icon on your screen, and we'll make sure to answer those questions at the end of today's session. I'll now turn today's webinar over to Julie. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you loud and clear. All right, great. So just want to give a warm welcome to all of the members that were able to join us this morning. Uh, good morning again. My name is Julie Pellini, and I am a public health specialist supervisor in the Bureau of Epidemiology at the Pennsylvania Department of Health. I am proud to serve as one of our outbreak and containment team responders in the Division of Healthcare Associated Infection Prevention. Our team conducts a variety of activities to control and prevent the spread of Candida auris, an urgent public health threat. Today, on the team's behalf, I present Improving Readiness, Candida auris Prevention and Control in the Long-Term Care Setting. So our learning objectives for today will include, we'll identify two reasons C. auris is a threat to long-term care facilities. We'll describe two actions that long-term care facilities can take to improve readiness for managing residents colonized or infected with C. auris. We'll also list three everyday practices that long-term care facilities must be consistent with to prevent and control C. auris. So I'm sure by now you have seen the headlines, deadly fungal infections spreading at an alarming rate, CDC says. Candida auris, what is the deadly fungus sweeping through US hospitals? and so on and so forth. In fact, we even see C. auris being referred to as a superbug. And while there are elements of these headlines that are true, I am here to let you know that we have a lot of experience with this organism and we know how to prevent and control it. In fact, we believe that following the pandemic response, the healthcare community understands the importance of infection prevention and control more than ever. So let's learn more about this yeast. First, I'm going to give some background information on Candida auris. So why are we concerned about C. auris? Well, to put it simply, C. auris is a yeast that acts like a bacteria. It is often multi-drug resistant, meaning that it is resistant to multiple antifungal drugs commonly used to treat candida infections. And many labs do not perform fungal susceptibility testing automatically. This would require a clinician to order susceptibility testing and outsource it. Patients can become colonized and develop invasive infections. These infections occur when candida auris enters the bloodstream or another sterile site. The invasive infections often result in long hospital stays and even death, and they are also responsible for high medical cost. C. auris has caused outbreaks in healthcare settings. For this reason, it is important to quickly identify C. auris in a hospitalized patient. When that C. auris status is known, healthcare facilities can take special precautions to stop its spread. And we know there has been worsening spread of C. auris in the United States over the last few years. Many of you have likely seen the paper that was published this year by Dr. Megan Lyman and other subject matter experts from the Mycotics Diseases Branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Here, the CDC team provides a descriptive analysis of Candida auris national surveillance data from 2019 to 2021. I'd like to share some of the key takeaways from that paper. 
First, clinical and screening cases are on the rise nationally. Sea Oris has now been detected in more than half of U.S. states. Most spread in the United States has occurred in high acuity, post-acute care facilities such as long-term acute care hospitals and ventilator-capable skilled nursing facilities. And there have been some important developments in the treatment of fungal infections. You may have heard of echinocandins. They are a relatively new class of antifungals and are used to treat invasive fungal infections. They show good activity against candida species that are extensively resistant. However, recent findings highlight that although echinocandin resistance is still uncommon, the number of cases with echinocandin resistance is slowly increasing, with a substantial increase in 2021 and multiple outbreaks of these resistant strains raising concerns about transmission. Other key takeaways from this paper include, the reasons for the steady increase in C. oris case burden are multifactorial and reflect gaps in early identification of cases. The timing of this increased C. oris spread and findings from public health investigations suggest it may have been exacerbated by pandemic-related strain. This would include things like staff and equipment shortages, increased patient burden and disease severity, increased antimicrobial use, and changes in patient movement patterns, among other factors. Going forward, new tools are needed, such as fast and more accessible colonization testing, improved disinfection methods, increased capacity for antifungal susceptibility testing, and new antifungal drugs. Similar to national trends, the cases we are seeing are spreading locally, and some have been found to have out-of-state epidemiologic links. The majority of cases do not have direct links to healthcare abroad at this point. Sea aura spreads between facilities when colonized or infected patients or residents are transferred which makes communicating a patient's MDRO status very important at the time of any patient or resident transfer. Healthcare facilities need to place patients or residents on proper precautions from the door to avoid a new introduction into their facility. However, as some of you may have experienced, a patient or resident's MDRO status is not always known at the time of a transfer, which contributes to new introductions in naive facilities. Typically, this yeast impacts the sickest of the sick. We observe few cases in healthy individuals. This includes patients or residents who are ventilator dependent, have tracheostomies, are colonized with other multi-drug resistant organisms like carbapenemase producing organisms, and patients or residents who recently received antibiotics and antifungals. Generally speaking, this organism is not a threat to the general public. It is believed that there is little risk to healthcare personnel. When this was studied in the United Kingdom, colonization among healthcare personnel was lower than 1%. Therefore, we typically do not recommend colonization screening among staff when an outbreak occurs in a healthcare facility. C. oris causes invasive infections with high mortality. 5 to 10% of colonized patients or residents develop invasive infection at some point in the future and 30 to 60% mortality has been observed at 30 days for those with invasive infection in the U.S. It is important to recognize that this yeast is known to persist in the environment and on shared and mobile equipment long after the index case is gone from the facility. It can survive for many weeks and common disinfectants such as quaternary ammonium compounds, or what we call quats, do not work. They are simply not effective at reducing the bio burden of this organism. 
it is critical to use an EPA registered hospital grade disinfectant with a claim against the ORIS. This is known as a list P disinfectant. In nursing homes, CORS residents require transmission-based precautions, either enhanced barrier precautions or contact precautions, depending on the situation. Contact precautions are recommended if the resident has acute diarrhea, draining wounds, or other sites of secretions or excretions that are unable to be covered or contained, and this should occur for a limited period of time. Of course, gowning and gloving with enhanced barrier precautions during the high contact resident care activities, as noted on this poster, is the preferred method and the least restrictive approach to managing C. Oris residents in nursing homes. And I do want to point your attention to the link that we have on this slide, which includes a frequently asked question page on enhanced barrier precautions. Now let's look at the Pennsylvania data. We have been messaging to our PA healthcare facilities for some time about C. Oris, trying to get the word out about how to detect cases and how to manage them. Here are the links to our health advisories on Candida Oris from the time of our earliest cases in 2020. At the bottom of the slide, there is a link to register for the PA Hans through the Pennsylvania Health Alert Network if you are not currently receiving them. Our latest CORS Han is highlighted here as PA Han 687, which was released on March 31st of this year. This update was shared with healthcare facilities and providers to share that we've seen cases now in new counties across Pennsylvania. Data suggests transmission has occurred in the majority of regions in Pennsylvania and case counts continue to rise. Previously unaffected counties where C or S cases were identified within healthcare facilities include Cumberland, Erie, and Monroe counties. Cases are still concentrated in the Southeast region, but detection in healthcare facilities in new regions of Pennsylvania indicate that facilities across the state should be on alert for C. Oris. As of March 31, 2023, 202 cases of C. Oris infection or colonization were identified in patients of over 30 Pennsylvania healthcare facilities across Allegheny, Bucks, Cumberland, Dolphin, Delaware, Erie, Lehigh, Monroe, Montgomery, and Philadelphia counties. This graph is showing the number of C. Oris cases in Pennsylvania by year. You can see that from 2020 to 2021, we nearly doubled the number of cases we saw in a single year. And the following year, we increased yet again. This trajectory can be explained by increased awareness, expanding our testing capacity across the Commonwealth, and the proactive response we continue to take with each new case that is identified. C. Oris has exclusively been identified in patients with healthcare facility exposure. On this PA map, we are showing C. Oris cases by county of healthcare facility where identified, with a total of 202 cases between March 2020 and March 2023. Starting on the left with Western PA, you can see C. Oris has been found in the most northwest corner of Pennsylvania and the Pittsburgh metro area. Allegheny County is represented by the second shade of blue in the range of 6 to 25 cases. Then in central PA, this region is represented by the latest of our blue shades to distinguish less than five cases have been identified. And in the southeast, moving into the northeast, we have a range of blue shades to indicate there is lots of activity in Philadelphia and the surrounding counties where the majority of the cases have been identified. 
And finally, this graph is capturing CORS cases by healthcare facility where identified N case type from March 2020 to March 2023. The darkest blue shade represents clinical cases. The light blue shade represents colonized cases. And the medium blue with lines going through represents colonized to clinical cases, meaning patients who were first found through screening and later developed infection. This provides a snapshot to highlight that most of our clinical cases are found in our short-term acute care hospitals, which we would expect because the ORIS is detected from specimens that were routinely collected as part of the patient's medical care. Whereas in facilities such as long-term acute care hospitals and ventilator-capable skilled nursing facilities, most of our cases are persons who are colonized and were found through the colonization screening recommended by state or local public health. Now let's discuss prevention and containment. For Candida Oris, we follow the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Containment Guidance for Tier 2 Organisms. Organisms in this group include MDROs or multi-drug resistant organisms that are primarily associated with healthcare settings and are not commonly identified in the region. The containment strategy includes activities such as rapid identification of cases, conducting infection control assessments to identify gaps and deficiencies, colonization screening to look for additional colonized persons, and a coordinated communication response between facilities. We continue these activities until the spread is actively contained. When you identify a new case of CORS, the following containment steps are warranted. Your facility should report to your local or state health department. Sea Oris became nationally notifiable in 2018, and that requires reporting to the local or state health office for guidance and support. You'll also want to implement infection prevention and control measures for Sea Oris. Since there are a number of facility level actions to take, it is helpful to connect with your local or state public health experts to ensure the containment efforts are adequate. Public health can advise if infection control assessment and colonization screening is recommended. It is also valuable to conduct laboratory surveillance to watch for signals of additional cases. And you'll also want to evaluate the patient's recent healthcare history and make necessary notifications to public health and the affected healthcare facilities. Public health can steer if containment activities are necessary at other facilities where the patient or resident had a recent stay. Now, our hope is that all of the participants on this call can put this information into action and seize an opportunity for readiness. If you have not yet had to manage C. Oris residents before, it is time to get your long-term care facility ready by taking the following steps in this checklist. First, you'll want to review facility policies and procedures. This includes policies around patient management and transfers. You'll also want to assess facility resources. Does your facility have private rooms? Is there a thoughtful policy for transmission-based precautions? And you'll want to evaluate current environmental disinfectants. It is important to ensure products are available in-house that have an effective claim against C. Oris. It's important these products are ready to go should you learn that you are managing a resident infected or colonized with C. Oris. Other steps to take on your checklist for readiness is to discuss laboratory capabilities for testing with your laboratory team. 
You'll also want to develop communication strategies to ensure effective communication and coordination, especially during resident transfers. And you'll want to engage local or state public health partners and ensure your facility is receiving public health communications, such as local or state health advisories, to stay up to date on the latest guidance. Our outbreak and containment team recognizes the successes of our Pennsylvania healthcare facilities, and we believe that our long-term care facilities are already well prepared to manage residents with C. auris and other MDROs. The key is to be consistent with everyday practices. This would include strict adherence to hand hygiene, including the use of alcohol-based hand rub. Also implementation of transmission-based precautions based on the setting type, and regular environmental cleaning and disinfection with recommended LISP products or having access to LISP products. Now let's talk about available public health resources. At Pennsylvania Department of Health, we remain committed to C. auris education. On Train PA, which is Pennsylvania's version of the Train Learning Network for Public Health and Healthcare Professionals, we have webinars available on demand. Two that I'd like to highlight include a recording of the Pennsylvania Sea Aura Symposium that we jointly coordinated with our colleagues at the Philadelphia Department of Public Health in September 2021. We also have a relevant training on choosing an effective EPA registered disinfectant. Furthermore, we have developed two Sea Aura's toolkits, one for public health and one for healthcare facilities. The toolkits include infection prevention and control recommendations, scripts for colonization screening, instructions for collecting specimens, fact sheets, transfer letters, and much more. And for any of our Philadelphia facilities that have joined us, our colleagues at the Philadelphia Department of Public Health have a C. Oris toolkit available through their health information portal known as the HIP. Healthcare facilities should be aware that we have a wonderful resource known as the ARLN. The ARLN or Antimicrobial Resistance Laboratory Network is a national network of seven region, regional public health laboratories and epidemiologists that are working closely with CDC and other public health and clinical laboratories within their states to detect existing and emerging types of antimicrobial resistance, to track emerging resistance more effectively, and to generate stronger data to combat future resistance threats. The Mid-Atlantic region of the ARLN includes the states of Maryland, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Virginia and West Virginia, North Carolina and South Carolina, and the District of Columbia. The Maryland Public Health Laboratory is the regional AR lab for our geographic area. The Regional AR Lab has many capabilities in how it supports public health with its containment of MDROs of high concern. Their current capacity as it relates to Candida auris includes Candida isolate speciation, antifungal susceptibility testing, Candida auris colonization screening. CDC continues to fund the regional AR labs through the ARLN. However, capacity is limited for C. auris colonization screening. With any high concern organism, the goal is to rapidly identify cases, and therefore we need to support labs in exploring their capabilities. We aim to provide technical assistance to clinical and reference laboratories through the regional AR lab to help build this capacity. 
And regarding our future plans as a state health department, we have received additional funding from CDC available through the SHARP grant. And SHARP stands for Strengthening HAI and AR Program Capacity. In addition to outbreak responses, CDC has urged their state partners to conduct prevention work, which will include a focus on high-risk settings, such as long-term acute care hospitals and ventilator-capable skilled nursing facilities. Our MDRO prevention team is made up of three staff that cover prevention activities across the Commonwealth, including education, proactive infection control assessments, detection through colonization screening, and facilitating communication aimed at preventing and controlling novel and targeted MDROs. Now let's take a look at an example of a sea oris containment response that will help put this information into perspective. And I do want to say that for our example, some of the epidemiologic details, such as risk factors, uh, test dates, and so forth, have been changed to protect the identity of the individuals and facilities involved. On February 12th, an acute care hospital notified public health of a new clinical case. It is reported that a patient who resides in a nursing home has been in the ICU and had a wound culture done on January 23rd that detected candida species. Risk for this patient included a surgical wound, Foley, and a central venous catheter. Because the IP was suspicious of this preliminary result, the patient was isolated at the hospital while we requested identification and confirmation of the organism. The astute IP reviewed the patient's labs and recognized an ESBL was detected in addition to candida species. The patient had been placed on contact precautions in a single patient room. The Candida isolate was forwarded to the regional AR lab in Maryland, and Candida speciation and antifungal susceptibility testing were conducted. On February 18th, the yeast was confirmed as Candida auris, and the patient was getting ready to return to the nursing home. A bed trace was conducted at the hospital, and we learned that the patient was on transmission-based precautions for part of the stay due to COVID-19. And due to the history of other MDROs. On February 20th, we learned of a second possible case of C. Oris. It was reported that a resident of the same nursing home is also suspected of having a C. oris infection. Risk for this patient included having a trach, Foley, and a PICC line. A respiratory culture conducted on 216 detected yeast, and the microlab flagged it for possible candida species. With a confirmed case and a new suspected case reported, the containment strategy was implemented at both the acute care hospital and the nursing home. Now you may remember the cycle of containment from an earlier slide. At this point in the investigation, we completed step one, which is a rapid identification of cases. Next, we will conduct an infection control assessment with colonization screening. The infection control assessment aims to conduct observations of infection prevention and control practices on the affected unit. Because C. oris can persist in the environment and can be spread by the hands of healthcare personnel, the focus of the observations will primarily be on hand hygiene, environmental cleaning, and the use of transmission-based precautions. As we follow up with the nursing home, 
We learned that the confirmed case and the suspected case were on the same unit known as the North Wing. On February 28th, we conducted a point prevalence survey of the North Wing, which included 13 residents. This includes collecting an axillocrine composite swab for all residents who are currently on the unit. This is because high C. oris concentration has been observed in both axilla and groin. It has also been observed in high concentrations at other sites, such as the anterior nares. As we plan for colonization screening, it is important to be aware of these key reminders. Colonization can last for a very long time, perhaps indefinitely, Colonization status can fluctuate between sampling, and some individuals do not become colonized despite high exposure. On the following day, March 1st, Public Health conducted an on-site visit to the nursing home to conduct an infection control assessment. We observed 59 critical moments for hand hygiene. 26 of 59 were determined to be successful, which translates to a 44% compliance rate. Some of our findings included the following. Multiple staff across disciplines were missing key moments for hand hygiene. One nurse was found to be double gloving when caring for the C. Oris resident. And while we understand staff are worried about bringing something home to their families, we must audit regularly to identify practices and provide feedback to avoid practices that could promote or prolong MDRO transmission. The IP also discovered keyboards for charting were not being disinfected at all. This was resolved by assigning this task to environmental services staff going forward. The identification of this specific gap prior to our visit demonstrates the importance of ongoing rounds to identify gaps and promote sustainable solutions. On March 3rd, we issued a post-visit recommendation letter to the nursing home to outline the purpose of our visit, the findings of our observations, and our recommendations in response. Here is an excerpt of that recommendation letter. Coming back again to our cycle of containment to bring it full circle, we need to ensure we have a coordinated response between facilities, and we need to continue to assess infection prevention and control measures and conduct screening until we can be assured that there is no further transmission or we have returned to baseline. We cannot stress enough how important coordination and communication is. Facilities should communicate the status of a C. oris resident anytime the resident is transferred to another inpatient healthcare setting, including the emergency department as it is part of the hospital. To aid in this effort, Pennsylvania Department of Health has created C. oris transfer letters for known cases and patients with a pending C. oris test result to assist in communicating with other healthcare facilities. The goal is to ensure that the status is both verbally communicated and communicated in writing via the transfer letter and the inner facility transfer paperwork. This will allow the receiving facility to place the resident in a private room and implement the appropriate precautions. The last step of containment is continued assessment and screening. Here you see a high level summary of the C. oris colonization screening that was conducted at this nursing home. A single colonized case was detected during point prevalence survey number one and number two, and then we had two rounds of negative results, even with a slight increase in testing, which was a good sign. 
When new cases are identified, whether clinical or colonized, we routinely review the case's healthcare history to determine if a containment response is necessary at other healthcare facilities. This can be challenging as many residents who acquire C. oris are very sick and move through various levels of care, sometimes within a single month. Therefore, it is not unusual to identify multiple healthcare facilities that require a containment response. We regularly identify C. oris at one site and then reach out to inform one or more different healthcare facilities that their units may have been exposed if the case was not managed properly. The timeframe for these tracebacks are between the 30 days prior to the test date until the individual was fully isolated as per the CDC guidance for C. oris patient management. Okay, so now that we've made it through the bulk of our presentation, um, I do want to um, invite our participants to uh, participate in this test your knowledge uh, portion of the presentation. So we are going to go through uh, four separate questions to test your knowledge. Um, and I think going forward, we're going to use the uh, chat feature. So if you can pull up your chat box, I'm going to ask our participants to um, put some answers in the chat box, and I will talk you through uh, each of the questions so it's clear uh, what is expected. So let's go to our first knowledge check. This is knowledge check one, and this is related to high touch surfaces. So our statement to keep in mind here is that Candida auris is an organism that persists in the environment. The question I have for our audience is what are some high touch surfaces that must be adequately cleaned and disinfected in the residence room? So I invite you at this time to go into the chat. And if you want to share any um, ideas that you have about some of the high touch surfaces in the residence room that should be adequately cleaned and disinfected. Okay, so I'm seeing bedside tables, call bell, doorknobs, faucets, bed rails. Mm -hmm. Yep, over a bed table, toilets, sinks, nightstand. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you for putting some answers there in the chat. Let's look at a picture of some of these high touch surfaces to bring this into perspective. So you'll see here, this is just kind of a standard, um, you know, healthcare, uh, resident care environment type picture. But I do um, want to point out that for those of you that were responding in the chat, uh, you were right on. You know, we have uh, the, you know, side table here. We have that handle that we know there's going to be a lot of high contact with that handle. Uh, we have, you know, the top of this side table where the resident um, might keep many of their personal belongings. We have this IV pole. We have, of course, our bed frame and our bed rails Ooh, that many of you um, mentioned as you were putting your uh, answers there in the chat. How about things like the blood pressure cuff that you see here? We also have this uh, movable lamp that would be high contact that might get touched frequently, um, you know, especially by the healthcare personnel that are coming in to uh, assess the resident. And we have the residence tray that a few of you mentioned as well. So I think you were right on there. And we're going to go to just the 
final slide here that just puts, um, you know, all of uh, the answers that you had into a list here, but certainly uh, this is not an exhaustive list. We don't have all of the high touch surfaces, um, but I think it's great to be reminded that, you know, we really want uh, the housekeeping staff to be, you know, paying close attention to cleaning and disinfecting the bed rails, bed frames, any of those movable lamps, tray table, bedside table, handles of any drawers or doorknobs, as uh, one participant mentioned, IV poles, and, you know, then any of that equipment, like uh, a blood pressure cuff, you know, certainly um, there's lots of contact with these items, and I'm sure we could think of, you know, many more things um, to include in this list, and I was really happy to see that some of your answers um, also were being mindful about the resident's bathroom room as well, which may be shared with another uh, individual. Okay, let's go on to knowledge check two. This is going to be related to selecting those disinfectants. And our statement to keep in mind here is that common disinfectants are not effective against Candida auris, so the ones that are commonly used. So our question here uh, for the audience is which of the following EPA registered disinfectants is the best choice for reducing the bio burden of C. auris in a healthcare facility. So this question is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to go to the next slide and I'm going to give you some choices to select from. And I know this is, might be a little bit challenging because, of course, uh, you know, you might want to be able to pick up these products and look at the manufacturer's instructions as we do, um, you know, to make sure that they're effective. But I'm going to give you a little bit of information about each and then ask you to put in the chat uh, which product you would select. So product A is seventh generation disinfecting wipes. And we can see on the label there that it promotes that it kills 99.99% of bacteria and viruses. Our active ingredient um, with this product is thymol. And this particular, um, this is an EPA registered disinfectant and it is on list N as in Nancy. Our second product, product B, is companion disinfectant wipes. And here, our active ingredient is citric acid. Uh, this product is also EPA registered, and it also is on list N as in Nancy. And then our third product is product C, and these are our super sani cloth disposable wipes. Uh, these um, have an active ingredient of uh, isopropyl uh, alcohol, um, as well as quaternary ammonium. Um, so it's a combination active ingredient there. And this product is on our uh, list P as in Paul. So this is also EPA registered, uh, but this is on list P. So go ahead in the chat and select whether it's product A, B, or C that you would select as a disinfectant uh, to combat C. auris. All right. I see some folks answering product C. Let's see if we have any other answers here. That's great, seeing lots of list C for product C. Okay. All right, let's go to the next slide and see what the correct answer is. So, if you said product A, that was not correct, nor was product B. We were looking for product C, and I think everybody who answered in the chat had that correct. And really the purpose of this, it's hard when you don't have the products in front of you, um, but really wanted to just drive home that point of, you know, making sure that there is a EPA registered list P product that's available 
in your facility should you find you received um, a C or S patient um, to your facility who's going to be a resident. Uh, we really want to make sure that, you know, we have that effective claim against Candida auris um, to make sure that, you know, our disinfection uh, will in fact be adequate. Okay, let's go to our next knowledge check, uh, and this is related to hand hygiene. So our statement to keep in mind here is that hand hygiene is an important everyday prevention measure to reduce the spread of C. auris. My question for the audience is true or false? So we're going to put true or false in the chat. Alcohol-based hand rub cannot be used for routine hand hygiene when caring for residents who are colonized with C. auris. So we're going to say true or false. Alcohol-based hand rub cannot be used for routine hand hygiene when caring for residents who are colonized with C. auris. Okay, I'm seeing some falses in the chat. Go ahead and we'll give it a few more seconds here for folks to put their vote in for true or false. All right, let's go ahead and see what our answer is here. And of course, for those of you uh, that answered false, you are absolutely correct. And this is because alcohol-based hand rub is the preferred hand hygiene method for C. auris when hands are not visibly soiled. If hands are visibly soiled, of course we want to wash with soap and water, but not only is alcohol-based hand rub effective, it is the preferred uh, method for hand hygiene when it comes to C. auris. So love to see that folks were getting that question correct. All right, and this brings us to our final knowledge check. This is knowledge check four, and this is related to resident transfers. So our statement to keep in mind here is that communication is critical when transferring C. auris residents to other inpatient healthcare facilities. So in the chat, this time we're gonna change to yes or no. If a resident is colonized with C. auris, yet has no signs or symptoms of active infection, is a notification to the receiving facility recommended? So please go ahead in the chat, just give me a yes or no on this question, and I'll just repeat it one more time. If a resident is colonized with C. auris, yet has no signs or symptoms of active infection, is a notification to the receiving facility recommended? Okay, seeing lots of yeses in the chat. Give everybody another, another second here to put their responses in. Okay. Go ahead and advance so we can reveal our answer. And you guys are killing it. The answer is yes. So if you answered yes, you are absolutely correct. And the point I really want to emphasize here is that both colonized and infected persons can spread C. auris within healthcare settings. So persons with a positive C. auris test are considered colonized indefinitely, and notifications of the C. auris status should be made during every transfer. So, so glad that folks are really understanding that importance of communication and coordination uh, with all the facilities that you network with. Okay, great. Good job, everyone. That is fantastic. So we'll just go ahead here and just want to tie things up with some key takeaways. C. auris can asymptomatically colonize patient skin, which increases the risk of infection and contributes to environmental contamination and transmission. 
We also want to encourage you to follow CDC guidance, which can reduce the risk of spread and the risk of infection. However, infection prevention and control relies on consistency and accuracy. And finally, we really want to uh, encourage you to work with your local or state health department to activate epi and lab resources when a C or S case is suspected or confirmed. Uh, you know, we really are, or even if you are getting ready to um, accept a transfer from another facility and C. Oris uh, may be, you know, unfamiliar to you, maybe this is still a bit of a novel thing for your facility, I really encourage you to have that partnership with your local or state health uh, office. Uh, they will be able to make sure that you have all of the resources that are necessary uh, to manage this resident successfully. And, you know, we have lots of success stories, uh, you know, where healthcare facilities were able to uh, accept residents to their long-term care setting uh, and, and really manage them in a very successful way. So uh, our message today is that, you know, knowledge really is power. And when you understand how to prevent and control this organism, uh, you know, you really are well positioned uh, you know, to not only manage C. auris, but other novel and targeted multidrug resistant organisms as well. And I just wanted to share some resources with you as we tie things up for this morning. Um, even as a C. auris expert, these are the resources that I really lean on in the everyday. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I'm sharing them with all of you. Uh, the first resource that you have there is uh, CDC's page on infection prevention and control for Candida auris. Uh, it, it, it's just a beautiful outline of all of the infection prevention and control measures that a facility um, needs to be aware of and needs to implement when they're managing uh, C. auris in their facility. I also wanted to share with you uh, the second resource, which is the consideration for use of enhanced barrier precautions in skilled nursing facilities. Um, I have to say that enhanced barrier precautions could be its own one hour uh, educational webinar. Um, and I think you will certainly see more education coming from our department on this topic um, throughout this calendar year. Uh, it's, you know, certainly a um, type of transmission-based precautions that, you know, we want to definitely promote in our Pennsylvania nursing homes. Um, and we really see a lot of great benefits by implementing uh, this particular approach. So, um, you know, please do, um, you know, pay attention to other educational webinars that uh, we will providing later this year on this topic as we get more information out there about enhanced barrier precautions and how to roll that out in your skilled nursing facility. And finally, another uh, really great resource uh, that I invite you to take a look at is this Candida Auris information for uh, patients and family members. Um, I think this is especially helpful in the long-term care setting, uh, you know, where um, family and friends may be uh, visiting uh, the C. Auris resident and, uh, you know, questions may come up about what the risk is uh, to them um, as, you know, a person that may be visiting. Um, there's some, some really great talking points there and, um, you know, just want to really emphasize that there's, you know, no restriction on visitation for, uh, you know, these um, C. Oris patients. Uh, there's lots of good info there that helps you navigate those waters, um, you know, with families and visitors who, uh, you know, may need um, some more information if they're not familiar with this organism. Um, and so those are the resources that I wanted to share with you. And my last slide here is just how to get in contact um, with my team. Uh, again, we are the Division of Healthcare Associated Infection Prevention at Pennsylvania Department of Health and the Bureau of Epidemiology. Uh, and this um, resource account here that you see in front of you is our uh, email inbox. So I invite all of you to uh, reach out to us at this email 
email address if you have questions or concerns or you need help finding any Sea Oris uh, resources. We'll be happy to um, share those with you. And this mailbox is um, monitored quite closely by our team. Um, so I think it is reasonable to expect a response, um, usually in the same business day, if not even much quicker than that. So I do invite you to take advantage of that. Uh, and maybe perhaps, um, I know we have just a couple minutes left, but I did want to just put uh, maybe a plug in for um, one subgroup of our team that maybe you've been hearing some information about. Um, at our department, we uh, within our division, we do have our PA Project First Line team, um, and they are a team that is dedicated to uh, providing education to frontline healthcare workers. So if you're a uh, long-term care setting could benefit from um, having some free education um, and maybe take some of the burden off of you as the person who might have to deliver all the education in your facility. Um, that team is, you know, really dynamic and um, really uh, excited to come out and um, deliver education both in person or virtually. Um, so we will be able um, to share some information on uh, how you can reach out to them. There's a one-page request form. Uh, this is totally voluntary, no strings attached, no cost to you as a facility. Um, so we'll make sure we get you those details on how to reach out um, to our Project First Line colleagues uh, should your facility be able to benefit from some education to your frontline workers. So I want to thank everybody so much for their time today. I hope this uh, presentation was helpful to you. Uh, and I'll take any questions or comments um, that our participants have at this time. Thanks, Julie. This was some great information that you were able to share with our group today. I did notice that Karen noted that her facility could really use those educations that you just spoke of. Um, so if you guys want to connect, I encourage that. Um, I did put a reminder in for anyone to submit any questions you have. And as always, if a question comes up after today's session, uh, please reach out directly to myself or Julie, and we'll be sure to answer that um, as soon as possible. And I thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, Julie, like once again, this, this was a really great session. I can't wait to have you back. Thank you so much, Kimberly. And um, I'll share that uh, PA Project First Line information maybe with you, and we could get that out to the members so that they have that handy in email. Does that sound good? Perfect. It looks like Kara just shared it in the chat. Oh, so great. Make sure Thanks, all Kara. attendees grab a hold of that if that's something that interests you. Thanks so much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Take care Thanks. now.